chapter 3 and honestly come to one of uh, the most important passages in all the Bible. As we'll see in just a moment in reading it, I think it'd be pretty obvious that um, almost every verse could be taken as its own message. And as slow as I preach, I was so tempted to go through every single verse here. Um, But I think we're better served to take it as a whole as we look at Romans 3, 21 to 26. Look with me, if you will. The apostle writes, But now... The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption of That is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is the word of God that we've read together this morning. Let's ask God's blessing as we try to help understand what he is saying here. Our Father, we do ask that the precious Spirit of God illuminates the truth of your word because without him we cannot understand what we just read. We need his help. And we desperately plead for it, that we might be like Christ. Awakened, please, the mind of one, if there is any here, that do not have saving faith in the Savior, and that they would see Christ as their only hope in life and death. We pray that your word would minister to us deeply this morning as we learn these precious truths. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. This morning I'm asking you a question for the title of the message, and that is, how can I be right with God? There's no question that this is one of the most important questions or the most important question you're ever going to have to answer. As you go throughout Scripture, you see a handful of people asking this question. It's something that comes up regularly. It's asked in different ways in different places. For instance, Job in Job 9 verse 2 simply states, How can a man be right with God? The rich young ruler that came to Jesus said, Teacher, what thing must I do to inherit eternal life? The Philippian jailer in Acts 16 who was on the verge of committing suicide and taking his own life, he fell into the presence of Paul and Silas and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Every true Christian that has come to the end of themselves, has asked themselves this question, how can I be made right with God? And I imagine there may be some children here. Parents, your kids are asking you questions like, how can I be certain that I'm going to heaven when I die? Young person or old person, this is a question that Paul is seeking to get across and ultimately it is one that you and I are going to have to answer. And it is one that the Bible is very clear on. As the the Apostle Paul has been building his case through Romans, I think we all understand, if you've been here with us some time, you understand Paul has been making a case that there is a God and that we have broken his standards. That God is angry with the wicked because of their sin. Their sin has offended him and his wrath is now revealed against them. And now what Paul is going to begin to say here as he transitions somewhat and he shifts his approach from just simply talking about sin and depravity to now talking about how that can be taken care of. He is talking now about how people like you and I, recipients of his wrath, can be declared righteous by God. That's the whole point. There is no way... I think to overemphasize the importance of the verses we just read. Virtually everybody in the handful of commentaries that I've been looking through 
from scholars and teachers and famous pastors, every single one of them emphasizes just how central Romans 3, 21 through 26 is to the understanding of the gospel. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great Welsh preacher, when talking about this verse, in essence said that this section is the sum of the full gospel. And he says when the rest of the Bible speaks about the gospel, it is always consistent or a further explanation of the six verses that we've just read. That's a tall statement. And if we zero in on the heart of what these six verses are talking about, we realize that Paul is dealing with the subject of justification by faith or how one is declared righteous in God's sight. That is vital for us to understand both intellectually this doctrine and to experience it by our faith in Christ. The reason that this doctrine is so important is because it intersects with the righteousness of God. As you go through this passage, you're going to find that word righteous or justify given in some form seven times in six verses. Now what exactly does it mean to be justified before God? To be justified, and this is something we need to be clear about. To be justified, when God speaks about that word in His word, He is talking about us being declared righteous, not necessarily us being righteous. It's important for us to get that. It is like a judge that makes an official declaration. When God justifies someone, He is declaring them righteous on the behalf of Christ. Now, it's important for us to get that because not everybody believes that. There are some sectors of Christendom that have the idea of what is called an infused righteousness. And the idea that they give is is almost like God gives you a measure of His righteousness in your heart by faith. And when you get this righteousness, it's like a seed that's planted. And now it's your responsibility to work that out. It's your responsibility to water the seed. It's your responsibility to till it, to work it. And over time, God's righteousness therefore becomes your righteousness. And someday God will look at you and declare you righteous because you've worked out your own righteousness. That is not the way the Bible talks about justification. Yes, there is a transformation that takes place for the person that truly knows Christ. But the doctrine of justification deals specifically with a legal declaration by God that you are declared righteous in His sight. One person says this about justification. says, God declares that He has accepted the sacrifice of Christ as the payment of our debt to the divine justice. And in place of the sin, He imputes or assigns as credit Christ's righteousness to us. In other words, when God justifies you or declares you righteous, He does so on the basis of the work of Christ on the cross. And now here we are asking this question that we, be, that we asked at the beginning. How does that happen? How is it that we are declared righteous? Well, if you look at the text, it is clear. It is on the basis of what Jesus did on the cross through faith in that work. That is the clear message of of, of Romans 3 and 4. That we are declared righteous by God through faith alone in Christ alone. That is our only hope in life and death. So let's understand as we go through this pivotal section. that We need to understand and get in our minds. That's what Paul is talking about. The declaration of righteousness for his people. As we go through this one clause at a time, one verse at a time, I hope that you see the richness that is here. Notice, first of all, if you will, as we go through this verses uh, 21 and 22, once you see that we are made righteous before God through faith and not by good works. We are made righteous through faith and not by good works. Look at verses 21 and 22. But now the righteousness of God has been made manifest apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There is no distinction. Now the words but now that are introducing 
of verse 21 is marking a clear distinction here. It's Paul's way of signaling us that there is a change of thought that's taking place. As we've been working through Romans 1 through chapter 2 through chapter 3, how can we forget, if you've been here through these sermons, the emphasis on the inward depravity of humanity? He, he, he paints it on full display. It's the darkest, blackest canvas you could ever see. In the, late, the, the, the last section we looked at, he said things like that there is none righteous, no, not one. Their throats are an open grave. And their feet are swift to shed innocent blood. And through that entire section, Romans 1.18 to 3.20, the name of Jesus is mentioned one time. And that, even that, is in the context of Jesus judging and condemning sinners. But now, because of the death of Christ, a new era has dawned. And now Paul is shifting his transition and he's, he's emphasizing not our guilt, but how that guilt is taken care of. Now did you notice what Paul said again in verse 21 when he says, you cannot be saved by the law. The word apart from gives us the idea of being independent from something. It's like when a baby starts walking or, or doing their baby things that they've always needed help with, you know what I mean? And they want their independence. They don't want mom and dad's help anymore. They're, they're walking along and you're thinking to yourself, they're looking like Frankenstein and they're about to bump their head, but they want to do it themselves. And they want to be independent. That's the idea here. Our justification, our righteous status before God is independent of our obedience. Now why does Paul say this? Because if you remember last week's emphasis, he said the whole purpose of the law is given to to show you the knowledge of sin, that your hand is over your mouth, that your excuses are done. And he says it again. It's like he just got done saying it, and and he's saying it again. Why does he do that? I think it's a matter of emphasis. It's as if he's saying here, look, just in case you didn't get this, I want to be crystal clear with you that you do not add anything, nothing, to your justification before God. Nothing. There's nothing you can do. There's no good work that God is going to look at that you committed this past January and say, Aha, they did good enough. They're righteous. Paul would agree with a statement from the great... American preacher Jonathan Edwards where he said that the only thing that you and I contribute to our salvation is the sin that it took to put Jesus on the cross. That's the emphasis of Paul's theology in Romans. So the question is, if if God's law, one of the greatest gifts that God has ever given to humanity, if it cannot save us, and it only declares us as condemned, how can we be made righteous? Verse 22 says that your righteous standing before God comes through faith in Christ Jesus to everyone that believes. Now the idea of faith in our culture is just simply a a, a mental belief or an acceptance of belief. And yet, true saving faith according to Scripture, is not separated from facts and knowledge because there are things you must understand about Jesus in your mind before you experience saving faith. But having an understanding of the gospel is not enough. Having even a mental agreement with the facts of the gospel is not enough. Because the biblical concept for faith is a confidence or an entrusting of oneself to a particular entity. And once you have the elements, the the knowledge of what Christ did on the cross, and you agree to the truthfulness of that statement, and you trust in Jesus to save you, that is what is called saving faith. Knowledge, agreement, trust. Cat, K-A-T. The classic example of this that we see in Scripture is in uh, chapter 4 of Romans. It's going to be coming out about Abraham and how Abraham was justified by faith. Abraham was walking along his merry way and he heard 
the voice of God. And God said, I am making a covenant with you that is going to be centered in the coming of the Messiah. And he knew what God said. He had a knowledge of it. He agreed to the truthfulness of it. And he trusted God. And God said, Abraham is counted righteous. That is the same way it happens for every single one of us. You may grow up hearing the gospel all your life. But you personally have to know it, agree to it, and trust it before you experience saving faith. Look, I know that every week that as I stand to preach, I'm talking to people who know a lot about the Bible. There's some people who have been going to church, I mean, maybe 60, 70 years. They've been reading the Bible. It's like every day they're digging deep in the Scriptures. But do not allow the devil to fool you because you have a lot of knowledge about God that you are okay. Or that somehow your knowledge is the equivalent of saving faith. Because you personally must trust Christ as your Savior. It's not enough to know. You must personally trust. Now before we move on, notice the phrase, in Christ. It's mentioned here a handful of times in these six verses. And if there is a loaded theological term in the New Testament. It is that one of being in Christ. To be in Christ basically means that because we are now the children of God through faith, we now have received all the benefits and all the blessings that comes from Jesus. Let me illustrate it to you like this. And I know this illustration is going to fail in some places, but if you belong to an organization like BJ's or Costco, you have certain benefits, certain prerogatives that other people do not have. Because you went from a position of being on the outside of BJ's to being on the inside. About five years ago when we moved here, somebody gave us a BJ's card. And look, I was like, what is BJ's? I've never heard of this. I'm not interested. We didn't use it that much. But man, we started going to BJ's, and I'm like, right off the bat, cheap gas, all right? So I just want you to know, if you're not a BJ's member, you don't get the cheap gas that I get. And even better than that, they have really cheap Starbucks coffee. I mean, to the point where, like, you couldn't get three bags at a location for what you can get at BJ's. If you are a member, you're in BJ's. And you get certain things and benefits that comes as a result of being connected to BJ's in an intimate way that nobody else gets. It's only those who are on the inside. And listen as we see in this text. All that comes in being in Christ, all of these riches that we see are beyond description. But you have to be in Him. We see here in this text as we're going to be coming up that God's grace is given to those that are in Christ. His unmerited favor to sinners like us. In Christ, we have that declared righteous status. In Christ, we have redemption. In Christ, we have propitiation. And on and on and on we might go. And the question is, how do we receive all of these benefits? It is by faith. Because the faith, without faith, no one is saved. As I've said before, I say again, faith is somewhat like an electrical wire. An electrical wire can take an electrical current that in and of itself that current would kill you. But it takes the the current of electricity And it can channel it in such a way that it heats our homes, it warms our meals, it can even put lights on to the church so we don't have to meet in the dark. And the receiver of the benefits that come from Christ is faith. The end of verse 22 says there is no distinctions, none. There's no other way to get the benefits of Christ outside of saving faith. It is through Him and Him alone. And if you are not a Christian, if you have not experienced uh, His saving work in your life, then drop what is in your hands. Drop your sin. Drop your pride. Drop whatever it is that is hindering you from Him and come to Him with open hands and receive Him today. The second thing to notice, not only are we saved, 
justified through faith and not of our good works, but we're also made right with God by grace. Now, pretty much this is the theme of the rest of uh, this entire section. But we'll look at verses 23 through 25. Notice, if you will, first of all, you see in verse 23 the need of grace. Verse 23, for all have sinned and, and, and fall short of the glory of God. This is one of those verses that is so succinct and so clear. We usually teach our kids this is one of the first verses they, they learn in a Christian home, right? And in essence, this is a reaffirmation of what Paul has already said. He's already said we're all depraved, we're all cut off from God, and we are all sinners and we all fall short of His glory. To sin means to act contrary to the will or law of God or to engage in wrongdoing. The scope here is universal. There is no exceptions. He says all have sinned. And this now highlights that we are in a sinful position. It highlights the need for God's grace because there's nothing in us that can merit righteousness. There's nothing in us that, that we could ever do that God would look on us and say, yes, you are now righteous. And it is our sin that causes us to fall short of God's glory. The idea of falling short here means to have a deficiency in something that is advantageous or something that is desirable. No matter how hard you work, no matter how hard you wish, no matter how hard you desire, you are always falling short. It's like a car that starts off in Virginia that's trying to go all the way to California. And you got one tank of gas. I don't care how big that tank of gas is, you're going to fall short of the destination. You cannot make it there. You are incapable. And it is the same with us. No matter how hard, we always fall short of God's requirements. And what is it that we're missing out on? Verse 23, the glory of God. Because our sin is what it is, we can never reach, we can never attain to the glory of God. His, his glory is His radiant excellence that Jesus had when He was on the Mount of Transfiguration that, that came from Him and the disciples had to fall on their face. This glory is the same glory that the shepherds saw when they, they were proclaimed as Christ having come that first Christmas evening. This is the radiant excellence that everyone will see on the final day when they stand before God. And friend, this is why we need grace. And that is why God chooses to come to us because we're always falling short. Verses 24 and 25, you see the location of this grace. Where is this grace found? Obviously, it's found in Christ, in Christ alone. But first of all, what is grace? Now look at verse 23 again. As it flows into verse 24, it says, For all ascending fall short of the glory of God and are justified, declared righteous, remember, by His grace as a gift. Grace is a beneficent disposition towards someone else. It is a disposition in kindness towards someone that does not deserve it. It's not that they have earned it, but rather it is a disposition out of the sheer kindness of their heart. They act in kindness. And if we are going to be saved, God has to do something in the realm of grace. Because if He responds to us rightly for what we deserve, all we get is His wrath. And let me ask you a question here. Do you really appreciate the grace of God this morning? Do you appreciate the grace of God? I can make you a promise. If you do not understand the severity and the depths of our depravity, you can never appreciate the goodness of God's grace. Because as we're coming out of that radical depravity, and, and the dark black picture that Paul is painting, it makes the grace of God shine all the brighter. Is the main reason that you and I do not appreciate God's grace is we do not see our situation as desperate as it really is. Now notice as he continues in this, before we do, what does Paul say this grace is? It is a gift. It is a gift that is given to those that are justified. 
Now verse 24. Notice as he continues again, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now here we're going to see some theological terms that are so rich. What is redemption in the context of God's saving work? Well, we use the word redemption at times, right? We'll say that if somebody has a, a coupon that they need to take somewhere, they can go in and redeem it and claim what is already theirs. The idea is getting something back that at one point belonged to you. The Greek word here means to release from a captive condition. The idea is usually in the context of slavery. And when it comes to a slave, there was a redemption price that had to be paid to set an individual free. Paul may even be thinking about the Egyptian slavery that the Jews were under for 400 years. If you remember that storyline in Scripture, the Jews lived a wretched existence when they were in, in, in Egypt. And their masters would tell them what to do every day and they had to do it. And if they disobeyed, physically they could be punished or even killed as a result of it. This slavery was so bad that the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, made a decree and he said that any time a Jewish woman had a baby boy, the midwife was to take the baby and throw it into the Nile River. And instantly that baby would be drowned or become food for crocodiles. And the point in understanding such a slavery is no one could rise and say, take your hands off my baby. They couldn't say that. Because all the midwife had to do is say, this is the king's orders. And people would be protected by the police to go and murder innocent children. And yet, there was a time when God brought His people out of Egypt. Through His redeeming power, through His own mighty hand, He broke the back of Egyptian bondage and made His people free men and free women by His redemption. And how are we redeemed? According to verse 24. As we are justified, verse 24, by His grace as a gift... Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Listen. Our redemption is in Christ. We too were slaves but not in a physical sense. If you go back to chapter 3 verse 9. That's where our slavery is. Where Paul says. For we have already charged that all. Both Jews and Greeks are under sin. We're all under the dominion of sin. There is no hope. We're all held captive by its power. It has literally bound us in chains of bondage. There's no prospect for release. There's no strength by which we could break out of it. And yet, for those that are in Christ, understand. Christ, the mighty Savior of His people, has come to this world. This world that is under the dominion and sway of sin. And he has brought out his people and redeemed them. Like Moses of old that was at the front of the pack. Leading Israel out in Exodus 14. It is Jesus who takes his people out of the dominion of sin. And into the kingdom of God. Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says this. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And I ask again, where does this benefit of redemption come from? It is by God's unmerited favor. It is by His grace through faith that it is received. The redemption from sin that we have the basis of our justification, God declaring us righteous, all of that comes and is received by faith. Now notice another layer of this grace in verse 25. Verse 23, for the context, he says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in, Jesus, uh, in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. Now, what in the world does the word propitiation mean? 
I doubt somebody's ever asked you at Food Line on aisle five, hey, I've just been wondering as I'm looking at these Coke Zeros, what does propitiation mean? What does it mean? What is propitiation? The context is always dealing with atonement. While we may not even use that word that much, the world uses the term atone. So it does something and they say, well, they need to atone for that. They need to make amends. Their guilt needs to be extinguished from their fault. And that's the idea here. And I think it's important for us to understand and establish that the word propitiation has a covering for sin that satisfies the wrath of God. As we saw in Romans 1 verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. Right now, God is bringing His wrath down upon this world. In the future, they will see it as they've never seen it before. And now here, this word propitiation means that a payment has been made to appease God's wrath. Of course, this idea flows out of Old Testament atonement theology. From the very beginning in existence of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, as soon as they sinned, God had to kill an animal to cover their shame. Abel had to make a sacrifice. Cain had to make a sacrifice. Noah, Abraham, all the way down the line. Sacrifices had to be made to cover sin. And as we breathe the air of Old Testament atonement theology, there is no passage that is more sacred and precious than Leviticus 16. We're not going to turn there for sake of time, but I would encourage you to read it on your own time. Because at that point in Israel's history, they worshipped in what was called the tabernacle. This was a, a portable tent of worship. And as they would go through this system of worship, there was places that kind of everybody was allowed in. There was a, a, a place on the inside that only a handful of people was allowed in. And there was one place that there was only one guy that could go there. This place was known as the Holy of Holies. This was not a place for foot traffic. This was not a place for business deals to be made. Only one time a year could the high priest, one guy, one time a year, could he go in to that sacred place. And God says, Aaron, when you go as the high priest of my people into that sacred place, you need to be very specific on what you do. He said, you need to make sure that you take a bath before you go in here. He said, you need to make sure that you put on special garments that you don't wear at any other time except this day. You need to make sure that you have a censer in your hand with burning coals and throw a couple of handfuls of incense on it that smoke may arise as you enter. But do not forget to take blood with you. Don't forget the blood because the blood that was shed from an innocent animal was meant to be an atonement for the sins of his people. And what was Aaron to do with the blood? He was to take it. The only instrument that was in that Holy of Holies was called the Ark of the Covenant. And there was one place that was above that called the mercy seat. In Leviticus 16, 14, God says this. Speaking of Aaron, he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. And in front of the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. And then verse 30 says, For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. And you shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. You may be thinking, thank you Seth for the Old Testament theology. What in the world does that have to do with right now? Look back at verse 25. Notice that word atonement. Because the same Greek word that is used for that word atonement, hilasterion, when the Jews took up their Hebrew scriptures and translated them into Greek, do you know what word they used to translate mercy seat over in Leviticus 16? This word, atonement. Literally, the place of atonement, the place of forgiveness. And where is this Forgiveness found 
for us. Where do we find amends for our sin? Verse 25, God put forward, uh, he, he put him forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Our resting place of atonement is found in the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. And now we have the forgiveness of our sins and the appeasement of God's wrath being poured out on us. One of the songs that we love to sing in our church is In Christ Alone. The second verse goes this way. In Christ alone who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. Here's the idea bluntly. The wrath of God and the anger of God that we have been seeing for the last three chapters, that we deserve to have poured out on us, is now poured out on Christ. The hell, the suffering that we deserve, all of that has now been poured out on His Son. And I ask the question again, how do we receive this benefit? Look at verse 25 again. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood. Look at the end of the verse. To be received by faith. My friend, you must answer the question honestly this morning. Do you have faith in Christ's sacrifice for your sin? The whole of your standing before God depends on it. The third thing, quickly. We notice at the end of verse 25 and 26. It is that we are made right with God in accordance with God's mercy and justice. Look at verse 25. latter portion of it says this. This was, shown, uh, this was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He has passed over former sins. Now what exactly does that mean? I mean if you read it just baldly you might look at it and say well there are times that God has not punished sin in a spirit of clemency. God just let people off the hook. And yet what I think he's talking about here in that 25th verse is that under the old covenant, God, even though this work of redemption was not completed, God passed over their sins because he knew there was an, a full atonement that was coming. The full work of salvation had not been done because Jesus had not died yet. And oftentimes people ask questions about how is our Old Testament Christians or believers saved versus people that are in the New Covenant. When seminary, I heard it explained like this. Old Testament saints were saved on credit. New Testament saints are saved on debit. When I was in college, my dad gave me a credit card that he explicitly said was for emergency purposes only. Now, I used that emergency clause a little bit liberally when I was in college, especially on Sunday nights when I needed Wendy's. And I just couldn't stomach the stale sandwiches. It tasted like saran wrap anymore. But here's the, here's the point. When I was broke and in need of money living in Knoxville, and I'd go take my dad's credit card and, and, and put it in the machine, fill up for back then about 25 bucks, I know I'm old. Or go to Wendy's and get a junior bacon cheeseburger for a buck, and I'd hand them my credit card. The payment was not paid at that point, was it? There was no, there was no money there. But Visa had an agreement with my dad because my dad was trustworthy, and they knew he would pay it. So the agreement basically is, we're going to spot you the money, but you got to pay it later. Debit, on the other hand, is drawing from something that's already there. The funds are already in the account, and as soon as you take it, the funds are brought down. And a helpful way to understand Old Testament, New Testament paradigm, because Christ did not come yet, is God is looking forward to the death of Christ and saving them by their faith through credit of what Christ was going to do because He knew He would do it. And yet for us, we are looking back, and now we are saved by debit 
And the merits of Christ that he has won through his sacrifice for anyone and everyone that will come to him by faith. Now look at verse 26 and we're done. Verse 26 says this, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Notice that phrase, just and justifier. This is precious. Just and justifier of the one that has faith in Jesus. How is it that the thrice holy God of heaven can look down and declare any of us righteous? Because as we've already seen, we're not. And there's nothing we can do. So how is it that God can declare us righteous and still be just? Through the years, I've asked people questions like, if God, if you were to stand before God, and God were to look at you and say, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? And I have had many people answer that question through the years by saying something like this. I would say, I've asked you for forgiveness. And that's enough. As if asking forgiveness is all that it is. And that makes sense to some people because, I mean, even we do that, right? Somebody offends us and we say, well, I, I, I'm going to forgive you. But the problem with this is a payment has to be paid or God has to sacrifice his holiness. And God cannot sacrifice his holiness. He cannot flinch one inch from that. So a payment has to be paid so he can still retain his justice and still declare us just. How does he do that? It is in Christ. It is because Jesus' payment, our sin being placed squarely on his shoulders on the cross was a sufficient payment for sin. Peter said, you are not redeemed by corruptible things like silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And I emphasize the point again. How does this come again at the end of verse 26? The one who has faith in Jesus. Outside Christ, there is nothing but condemnation. Outside of Christ, there is judgment upon your sin. Outside of Christ, there is the wallowing in the filth of your own depravity. But in Christ... There is forgiveness. In Christ, there is grace. In Christ, there is redemption. In Christ, there is the appeasement of the wrath of God. In Christ, there is justification. And on and on we might go. How can you be made right with God? Simply by trusting in Jesus. Jesus did it all. All to Him we owe hearing the message of the gospel, knowing it, agreeing with it, and trusting in it. And the key question that you need to ask this morning, my friend, is have you trusted Christ as your Savior? And if not, I plead with you to do so. And if you are trusting in Christ, then keep trusting Him and spend the rest of your life learning what happened to you the moment that God declared you righteous. Because it will take a lifetime and maybe all of eternity to learn the ramifications of it. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Let's pray. <clears throat> so we have our heads bowed and our eyes closed all around. We are going to prepare for the Lord's Supper.